give without a great introduction. Uh, now I don't know if I can live up to the expectations. Anyway, uh, first thing I wanted to do is ask you for some help because I actually had it in mind that I, I should finally join the Twitter world. And uh, I was really glad to hear Kevin say, yes, we should, we should do it. But I would like to have a really cool name. And I wonder if you guys can suggest something. And I'll give you an example of what I'm looking for. I have a colleague in Saskatoon. Her name is uh, Dr. Megan Vankowski. And you can guess what her Twitter name is. Dr. Vankowski. So I was thinking of something like uh, maybe Hector the Crop Protector. But I don't know if that's, that's quite, quite, quite good enough. <laughs> anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a, uh, a practical solution on how to manage flea beetles. So uh, if you were looking for a practical solution on how to manage flea beetles without the uh, seed treatments, maybe you can start on early lunch because I'm not going to provide it to you. But I will provide you with all the information that I know about flea beetles and some of the bases that can help us to, to manage them if we have fewer options. So let's see what is the plan. Okay, first is I should always uh, acknowledge the people who helped me do the work and right now we have a pretty large flea beetle team working uh, trying to help you find solutions. Uh, the PI for, for the current cluster project is Alejandro Costamagna and Tarshi Nagalinga is a postdoc with him. Uh, we also have other scientists uh, with Canada, Tyler Twist in Saskatoon, Jennifer Tani. Uh, my technicians are uh, extremely helpful. Uh, John Gablowski with Manitoba Agriculture is also part of his team. And the plan of attack, if I can get to the next slide, is I want to first remind you about flea beetles and their biology, and uh, this is kind of my mantra in pest management. You want to manage a pest more rationally, you have to know the pest really well. So this is going to be uh, your uh, flea beetle biology 1000. Uh, the 101 is for other conferences. This is the Farming Smarter Conference. This is the flea beetle biology 1000. Okay, I'm going to also uh, review some of the current management strategies. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the thresholds, and uh, yes, we have validated the threshold for flea beetles. And then I, I want to spend more time on uh, what could we do for flea beetles uh, in terms of preventing risk and how we might manage them, if we can, without uh, with fewer insecticides. And then I'll talk about future research. So with that, let's get started with the uh, flea beetles. So what are flea beetles? Well, flea beetles, the pests that we have here belong mainly to two, uh, two species, the Phytotreta crucifer and the crucifer flea beetle. This is the more common one that you will see jumping around. And uh, it, it's a very appropriate name, flea, because they actually they jump. And if you look at one close enough, they have pretty, pretty very enlarged uh, femur, their legs there. If you, if you were a flea beetle, you could easily jump and make it to the, uh, to the roof. That's going to be the proportion of uh, how, how high a flea beetle can jump. Uh, Phytotreta striolata, the crucifer flea beetle, we are beginning to see more of that species. It's, it's one that is more common in the humid areas and it's a very interesting species uh, as you will uh, learn later or probably already have heard about it. There is another species called the hop flea beetle, and uh, this one is not all that common, but it seems to be out there and it's more uh, earlier in its uh, phenology. So flea beetles are a chronic pest, and if somebody asks me, uh, Hector, what is the, um, the uh, worst pest for a crop in the prairies? And uh, it's a very, very easy answer. I say flea beetles, because they're widespread throughout the prairies. Uh, they are fairly chronic. So you always have some issues with flea beetles somewhere. Uh, they're interesting, interesting complex because there are differences depending on the ecoregion, depending on where you are. You may find uh, the crucifer flea beetle is dominant here. If you go to central Alberta or northern Alberta or uh, Saskatchewan, you will find the striped flea beetle is more abundant. And we have been seeing some shifts in their phenology also. So the, the life cycle of the flea beetle goes like this. Uh, right now, if you, if you want to find out a flea beetle, you would have to uh, dig them out of the leaf litter in tree shelters. That's what, what they like to over winter or in uh, uh, road margins, grassy areas, wherever there is a lot of leaf litter, that's where they overwinter. 
then depending on the species, if you were a hopefully beetle, you wake up a little bit earlier. If you're a stripely beetle, then about a week later. And then the laziest one is the crucifer flea beetle. That one wakes up quite, quite late. Uh, and there are possibilities to manage them depending on seeding date. So the flea beetles, they, uh, they will lay their eggs around the bases of the, the plants. They lay hundreds of eggs. Luckily, some of those eggs are eaten by, uh, by predators, like rabbit beetles uh, from the other insects. Then they turn into little larvae and they dig into the soil and find the roots of the plants. And there's very little research on whether that has any effect on the plant. The thinking is that there's it's not really much of an impact. And that stage of the life cycle of the flea beetle is something that we have not really exploited too much. And I think there might be options in terms of uh, finding some uh, natural enemies. Uh, they recently discovered that some nematodes in China that are effective to control the, uh, the flea beetles there. And that's something that we might consider as an option in the future. So later in the summer, the flea beetles will come out. There is only one generation for flea beetles. And the, uh, generally, the adults do not have any uh, economic impact on the plant. Uh, one year, my colleague Julie Soroka found hundreds of flea beetles on the paws uh, at the end of the summer, and she got uh, funding to do research. As, and as it often happens, when you get money to study an insect, they kind of disappear. So uh, she never again saw enough insects feeding on the pods to actually validate or do any, any uh, meaningful studies. But once in a while, you do see these very large numbers, but it's not very often. So let's take a look at the uh, life cycle a bit more. Here I'm showing the, uh, the uh, emergence patterns. This is the data from uh, Ulmer and Tostel from 2006. And they show here that this is the crucifer flea beetle. If you were looking at the striped flea beetle, it would be a little bit, little bit earlier. But you can see there that uh, depending on the year and the temperature, they, they will uh, come out of the overwintering sites. When the temperature is around 10 degrees, they walk around. And usually they will hop into the edges of the fields. And that's kind of important because there might be also options of, uh, of using trap crops. Except if it gets very warm. And once in a while in southern Alberta, we do have uh, spring days with 25 degrees. And then it's a problem because the flea beetles can uh, get into the field more like rain. And uh, become a real, a real challenge to manage, to manage them using trap crops, for example. So I mentioned earlier that there are uh, different uh, species compositions depending on the ecoregion, and we have seen a clear shift in terms of the species composition. This is uh, data showing the percentage of the striped flea beetles. And you can see in, uh, in southern Alberta, in, uh, in um, the yellow bar is for data before 2007. And around Lethbridge, we, we did a study uh, it's 15 years ago or so, and if you take 1,000 flea beetles, uh, only one of them would have been this striped flea beetle. Uh, however, now, in, after 2016, you can see that we can see up to uh, sometimes 15, 20, 30 percent of the flea beetles are actually striped. And if you look at Saskatchewan, it's even worse, about 80 percent of populations are striped flea beetles. And in Manitoba, it's, it's not any better. So it looks like this striped flea beetle is becoming more dominant, and there could be a couple of reasons for that. One is that we actually had a good series of wet years in the last decade, so that could be one explanation. The other one that is uh, quite interesting is that this striped flea beetle survives the neonicotinoid insecticides better. And I will sh show you a data set that I found from, uh, uh, this is published by uh, one of uh, Lloyd Dostal's uh, postdocs. Okay, if we just focus on the, you be on your right, the uh, thiamethoxam, that's uh, the active ingredient in Helix. You can see there the the, the uh, darker bar. It's uh, the striped flea beetle, striolata. You can see the mortality is much lower compared to the mortality of the uh, crucifer flea beetle. So that could be another reason why there could be a shift dominance also for this trifle beetle now, uh, now uh, becoming more, more common. So this, this is a bit of biology. Let's take a closer look at the kind of damage that flea beetles do. And 
I think most of you are familiar with this. Uh, we have we had a, an objective as a, as a previous uh, cluster project to validate the, the nominal threshold for flea beetles. You can see the the uh, here's the, the crucifer and the striped flea beetles, and these are the areas where we did this study. And for many many years, uh, farmers and agronomists have been recommending 25% as the nominal threshold. So we decided to, uh, to uh, take a stab and actually validate this. You see, because the because the canola council was becoming concerned about the possibility of losing the unique and having to, to uh, use more foliar spray, so they wanted to make sure that we at least have a good handle on the uh, economic thresholds. So we did this using plot studies, and this is a scary picture, I guess. Uh, this is what happens in small plots when you don't use a seed treatment. And believe it or not, there are little canola seedlings there. Somewhere you can see uh, farther in the distance are the ones that had the, the seed treatments, and also some of them have had foliar sprays. So we did this study over three years, uh, and, and the study was done in Beaver Lodge, uh, Lethbridge, Saskatoon, uh, and also in southern Manitoba in a few sites. We, we had quite a few sites, and in, I think out of something like 20 site years, we only had a significant result in two sites. One was in Lethbridge, another one was in, in Saskatchewan. Uh, in a lot of years, the data was extremely variable, and we could not get a statistically significant difference between the, say, the control and the foliar and the seed treatments. But I will, I will show you some of the results here. Uh, this is Voxel in 2017, and uh, this is the the, uh, the plot that had more than 40% damage on the cotyledons. And, the yields, as you'd expect, were not that great. This is about uh, 100 grams per meter square, which would be about 17 bushels per acre. And in the seed treatment, the, bushel, the yields were um, actually not significantly higher. You can see the letters are shared, A, B versus A. So it was higher, but not statistically significant. And that was the early planted site. In the late planted site on the right, actually there's hardly any any difference because the flea beetles were not uh, very abundant. And the one interesting result that I've noticed in the last four years is that uh, the uh, the uh, tests that were planted early, or I said earlier, which would have been around early May, those are the ones where we actually had more flea beetle damage. And the tests that were planted later after the middle of May tended to have less damage and that was opposite to what I had noticed in the, in the past. So I'll show you one more data set. Uh, this is from, uh, I believe, the Lethbridge site 2016. And I think this is the only test where we saw significant effect, significant difference there. The uh, seed treatment had much higher yields than the control. And the treatments there refer to the percentage of cotyledon defoliation at which we spray the insecticide. So 45%, 25 and 15%. And yes, the, uh, the foliar spray helped to mitigate the damage and protect the yield to some extent, but it was not quite to that level of the, uh, of the seed treatment. So, so what are the implications for IPM then? If we if we do not have uh, seed treatments and uh, we have to rely more on other uh, tactics, there are actually some agronomic options that are that are uh, that have been researched at least in plots. There's nothing that has been tested at the field level, and uh, I think Ken Coles will probably be interested because I know he's asked me if. Uh, if uh, there is a possibility of doing some on-farm research, and I have some experience working for ligus bugs and doing trap crops for sepal weevils, and probably it's a good idea to start taking some of these uh, research from plots and actually testing them at the farm level. So I went through the literature and looked at what has been done as far as agronomic practices, and tillage is one that uh, has been shown to have an effect. So if you want to attract more flea beetles for some reason to your fields, go ahead and till the, till the fields. They seem to like clean clean soil, bare soil. Uh, they don't seem to like the no tillage or uh, 
uh, all the debris and the heterogeneous habitat on the, on the surface. I guess they prefer to have clean soil and probably the reason for that is temperature, that uh, it's going to be warmer in till soil, so they are more active there and they can lay more eggs there. So that's one, one of the things that, uh, that uh, I think we're doing right. So if, we, if we're doing less tillage, we are already reducing the risk of flea beetles. Next one is uh, seeding dates. And uh, seeding date is um, it's a, it's a difficult one. Uh, here I'm showing some data that we collected for a study we did with uh, several agronomists across Alberta from the Peace River, uh, Central Alberta, and Southern Alberta. Here I've only collected the data for the South. And you can see in 2003, I'm showing here the mean number of flea beetles per sticky card per week. And we have two seeding dates, April versus May. And in 2003, there was hardly any difference. However, in 2004, if you planted in April, you pretty much avoided the flea beetles altogether. And the, the uh, plots planted in May had significantly higher numbers of, uh, of uh, flea beetles, and the damage would have been in a similar pattern. But it's very difficult to predict. And as I mentioned, over the last four years, we actually are seeing more damage in the earlier planted uh, plots compared to those planted later. And I suspect that part of the reason for that is that we are seeing a higher proportion of the striped flea beetle in those plots. And the striped flea beetle wakes up earlier and becomes active a little bit earlier. So that's probably the reason why we're seeing more damage now in the earlier planted. Now, if you plant it really, really early, let's say you plant it in October the previous year, that would be really early planting. And, and if we had winter canola, or if we found a way to actually plant, plant it in the fall, then I think we have a, we have a better chance. And here is uh, some data collected by Floyd Dostal and uh, Stevenson from 2005. This, this would be from uh, uh, Beggarville, and I think they also have some sites in Lethbridge, and this data is all, all cool. You can see there in the, uh, in the white bars that there's hardly any damage on, uh, on those cotyledons. And, uh, if you're wondering what those labels are, if you remember Vitavax RS, that's the one that had been made. And uh, that one was a very, very uh, effective compound that, uh, that would uh, uh, take care of all the flea beetles, all the wireworms, but there were some issues with, uh, I guess, and, and it was uh, deregistered. Anyway, so you can see there that if you actually succeed in getting canola to overwinter and survive the winter, if you plant it in the fall, then the crop is going to be at an advanced stage and you will escape uh, flea beetles. It doesn't mean that there won't be any damage. It means that the, once the plants are at the true leaf stage, once they have uh, two, three, four leaves and they're growing well and uh, the, the crop is not stressed, then they are going to be able to tolerate the flea beetle damage. So that's, that's one that works. Uh, here is another one from Lloyd Dostal, and this one is uh, looking at the... Uh, oh, I forgot to mention that in, in this study they also looked at seeding uh, rates. They have 7, 10, and 12 kilograms per hectare. And I think 7 kilograms is already probably close to twice as what, what the common seeding rate is uh, these days. In, in this data set they found no effects of uh, seeding of the seeding rate on the flea beetle uh, damage or the yield. Uh, I want to mention that uh, they repeated this story, or they, they had another data set, and in, in this one, they were looking at uh, a variety of economic factors. Here you can see actually, there's, uh, there's your zero tillage and the conventional tillage, and you can see the data showing that there is uh, less number of flea beetles or damage when you have zero tillage and also they looked at the row spacing. And interestingly, if you plant the canola at 30 centimeters apart, for some reason there would be less damage. And, and uh, the, the authors did not explain why that might be the case, but this was the pattern they observed. And the other interesting pattern there is that there was an effect of seeding rate also. You can see there, five kilograms per hectare, 7.5 and 10 kilograms per hectare, and there is a clear pattern there. There is uh, less 
damage on the seedlings if you plant at higher seeding rates. Uh, they didn't talk about yield in that study, but we have another study that uh, we, we just started this year and uh, we had a site at uh, Farm Smarter. And uh, here I'm showing the, uh, the yields in Bussels Breaker. Uh, we still have not analyzed the data for damage, but you can see there a nice clear pattern also. You can see we have three kilograms per hectare, uh, six kilograms per hectare, which would be maybe some farmers are planting at that high, high rate. Uh, more likely, majority are planting at a lower rate than that. And 12 kilograms per hectare was added to see if that would make a difference. I don't think that would make you any money though. Uh, but you can see there that there, at, at three and six kilograms per hectare, you see uh, an effect of the uh, of the uh, helix seed treatment. I think uh, it was a uh, thymetoxam that was used, and we also have a foliar treatment in blue there. And you can see a small effect of um, protecting yield from the foliar, but it's not significant. The seed treatment was significant, and it was higher in the in the three and six kilogram per hectare seeding rate, but it disappeared when you planted at the high seeding rate. So if you have a whole ton of money and you want to invest it in, in high seeding rates, then you will be able to manage the flea beetles that way. But like I say, you might not make too much money though. So I'm going to review some of the uh, other literature that I found on how to protect ourselves from flea beetles and uh, Bob Elliott did a lot of work on flea beetles and still in vigor, and he has a series of uh, papers that show very clearly that if you plant the bigger seeds, you actually will have less damage and you will you will protect your yield just by planting bigger seeds, because this this will grow uh, very fast. Uh, they can um, kind of escape the flea beetles by, by growing faster and you also will have more vigorous seedlings that can tolerate the feeding from the flea beetles a lot better. And he showed very clearly that you can have higher yields by, uh, by uh, selecting for bigger seeds. So I'm not sure how you do this in practice. Would you ask your uh, seed provider to only sell you bigger seeds? Probably will charge you more for that. But that, that's one strategy that uh, Bob Elliott showed that that uh, helps to protect ourselves from free beetle feed. Okay, another thing that um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have a bit of a soft spot for intercrops, because uh, when I did my master's degree, I studied intercropping and how I could find more carabic beetles in intercrops versus monocultures. And I know George Clayton is a big fan of intercrops, right, George? <laughs> He's not. <laughs> so you will like this data, George, because uh, the intercrops do not seem to help us to manage the flea beetles, which I, I found it quite disappointing. Um, and I was, I was kind of surprised that, uh, that somebody said that there's 50,000 acres of uh, piola in Saskatchewan. Have you guys heard this term before? I just heard it this, this year for the first time at a meeting. Piola is, uh, is uh, I think Australians came up with it. It's a P and canola intercrop. And uh, I know from, from the literature in general for managing insect pests in the tropics that intercrops are very common, but you have very different systems, very small, small uh, farms that uh, you, you can have a great deal of heterogeneity and a mosaic of different crops. So, so insect pests have a hard time finding crops in these cases. And the idea is that if you if you plant uh, canola together with peas, um, flea beetles and pea leaf weevils would actually be using volatiles from the crops to find them. So if you provide them a cocktail of plants, you actually might be able to confuse them. But in the, in the plots, it hasn't seemed to work very well. Uh, in this study, they, they didn't find a significant difference here, although they, they did know that there's a pattern uh, they have different ratios there of canola and peas and they looked at the number of, of individuals flea beetles and I, I like the way they actually sampled this. They, they took a barrel, they put it in the middle of the plot and then they vacuum everything to get an actual density. Uh, we're a little bit lazy and we actually use sticky cards to, uh, to measure them. But here they actually found that uh, there, there were fewer flea beetles in the intercrop compared to the monoculture. But it wasn't enough to actually protect the crop. I think the damage was similar, a 
and also the yields were not any better, so these uh, authors did not recommend intercrops. The, uh, the um, land equivalent ratio, which is how you measure the efficiency of an intercrop, was, was less than one, so they said thumbs down for the intercrop. Okay. There was actually another study of uh, intercropping that was done in Lacombe in the uh, 2000s, and this work was done, oh, I see I'm a little bit uh, running out of time, but I'm getting close to the end. <laughs> Uh, this work was, was done by uh, one of Lloyd Dostal's students, Jeremy Hommel, and they have very low flea beetle pressure, and here they were intercropping canola with, uh, with uh, wheat, and the numbers again did not look very good. Before that, actually, Rick Potts uh, did a study in the mid-1990s, and in that study they, they had uh, canola and peas, and they did find lower numbers of flea beetles but they didn't say too much about the yield, so I, and they, that work wasn't published, so I couldn't tell you too much more about that. So that is intercrops. There are some other alternatives that are on the horizon. For example, there, there are biopesticides, and this is work coming from my friend Gary uh, Reddy, who's uh, actually not very far from us, oh, 150 kilometers south of uh, Lethbridge in northern Montana, and they have tried a pile of uh, potential biopesticides, and I'll, I'll just highlight here, uh, oh, I guess I, if you look at the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, the one with the lowest one here, this would be Boveria bassiana and uh, Metarhizium bronei. Those are two, uh, two uh, fun, fungi, I guess I learned today that it's fungi, not fungi. Anyway, there's two uh, fungi that like to eat insects, they kill them, and they seem to be effective. And this is not actually big news to me because I did a study on severe leaf beetle and we know that you can kill insect larvae with, uh, with this uh, uh, fungi. The problem is the cost and I think that's the challenge for the industry to actually develop this into pesticides that can be applied commercially and sold at a price that makes sense for producers. Okay, and I must mention uh, for the future, there are various strategies that people are working on. Uh, I, I think you all know about hairy canola, and this is something that could be effective, uh, and, and there is germplasm available. And I think we just need to get more plant breeders interested in using this technology and actually uh, developing commercial cultivars. I'm also aware of uh, work that is happening at the University of Manitoba, uh, Stephen Wire Lab is working on gene silencing, and this is a very promising technology that is very, very specific to an insect pest. And I think they are now at uh, the field scale testing uh, for this product, so they are out of the lab and actually testing it in the field. So hopefully we'll see some of those products available in the future. Uh, I mentioned trap crops and intercrops. I think there's still room to do more research on, uh, on trap crops and maybe designing the way we plan our rotations and our crops to try to, to uh, make it harder for flea beetles so they're not, not having an easy way finding our crops. Biological control. Uh, so far we have not found and people have looked hard in many places to look for any predators or parasitoids that are effective. Uh, there seems to be a wasp that was released in Manitoba that uh, I believe is from uh, Eurasia. And that range in their, in their own habitat, they can kill almost half of the flea beetles. So I think we should revisit that and see if uh, that has an, any potential for us. There's always conservation that we can all do, and this is basically means following the threshold, so we don't spray insecticides unless uh, we, uh, we really have to. So until we have these uh, new tools available, I think in the meantime, what should one do for uh, flea beetle management? I think First, we should pay attention in the fall and see what kind of flea beetle numbers are there. And yes, we still have seed treatments available uh, for the moment. Uh, and, and also there is Lumiderm. I think its, it's register is probably also expensive though. And I think if I was growing canola, I will seed as early as I can. Because uh, there, is, there is clear information that if you delay seeding too much, you are going to have a yield penalty, yield penalty just by waiting too long. And if I could get a hold of big seeds, I would plant the bigger seeds. And I would, um, if I know that I have a, a risk of flea beetles in the area, 
I wouldn't go with the lower ceiling rate, so try to go as high as, uh, as my pocket can allow me. And you may have to be monitoring your, your crops more often than in the past, uh, especially if you have a very, very high temperature days, like if it gets to 25 degrees, you could have flea beetles moving into the fields. And yes, the threshold has been validated, the 25% that we've been using is, is the correct threshold. And I believe with that, I will thank you for your attention, and I guess I, it's almost lunchtime. Well, thank you, Hector. I see people are already uh, uh, weighing in with some uh, Twitter titles for you. One said that you have a real love of spiders, and so they suggested Dr. Spider. So uh, uh, I know that we'll have some fun with that. We'll give you one quick call for questions. Otherwise, uh, you're going to be around. So if you have a question for uh, Dr. Hector. Oh, we've got one quick question. Go ahead. So the question was, any question? Any uh, d work done on uh, soil fertility relating to uh, flea beetle damage? I have, not, I have not come across any studies on uh, soil fertility, on uh, flea beetle damage, but I, I suspect that uh, we should start with a very healthy crop. So if, if there are going to be issues with uh, fertility and the crop is not getting enough of the nutrients it requires, it's probably going to have a hard time for the rate so good idea to make sure that you, your soil fertility is, is uh, as needed. So the healthier the crop overall, no. the easier it is to resist the flea beetles. Okay. Good. All right. Well, with that, uh, let's uh, once more thank uh, Hector Carcamer. I've got your thank you card down there, so I'll give that to you. Uh, thank you very much.